Hello everyone. I'm excited to welcome you to Live Healthy Naturally, where we flip the dialogue about health and wellness in terms of what your body can do on its own and your ability to heal from many so-called lifelong diseases. I'm your host, Dr. Sandra Shridharan. I'm an naturopathic doctor practicing out of Dallas, Texas. And I'm also the founder of Hygia Homeopathy and Hygia Holistic Retreat. Are you ready to hear the stories of healing and the many journeys of people healing from autism, autoimmune conditions, and many more? Then, listen on. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Live Healthy Naturally. I love that, you know, you come back for every episode of ours. And here today, I have a special guest. It holds a very special place in my heart, which is pregnancy and childbirth. I think many of our children's health starts at conception, not necessarily once they are born and they actually have a disease. That's not where it starts. It really starts at conception or even before conception with the health of the mother and the father and even the drugs that they take. And I have seen time and time again, so many children suffer because they are not informed about these kinds of things and they don't know. And I'm a believer of when we know better, we do better. So here I have a very special guest, Megan Pritchard. She is a licensed midwife as well as a certified professional midwife. I just learned what that means today. (laughs) So it means that she's nationally and state licensed and she's also a nurse. And so we're going to talk lots of things about what are the myths of pregnancy? How do we have to go through labor? What are the steps to that? How can we have a natural labor that feels completely normal and natural as well as the best outcome for the mother and the child? And so that's the reason why I have this. And I love, love, love talking about these things because I think, you know, when we prepare the foundation right, naturally the house is going to hold right. The same way is true for, you know, pregnancies and childbirth and then the child's health. You know, for the longest period of time, you know, since humankind has been on this planet, we have been obviously having pregnancies and giving births. But today, if you look around, it's become such a sterile experience. You know, everybody is so concerned about pregnancy, so concerned about getting pregnant in the first place. Getting pregnant has become such a big deal or such a big chore these days. It's like almost so difficult. So many people have challenges getting pregnant in the first place. And then when they do get pregnant, there's so much of fear associated with pregnancy and how to actually get that pregnancy to term and have childbirth. And it was so natural before, you know, they didn't really need doctors. They just did that as a community. People in villages, you know, the older people would come and help a pregnant mother give birth to a child and then take care of the child as soon as the baby is born as well so that the mother can actually have the rest and nourishment that she needs. And it is such a beautiful process of building communities and connection versus today we go to the hospitals. And I personally myself, I wouldn't say horrible, but bad childbirths myself because, you know, I was not really aware of amazing midwives like Megan and I didn't know the process here in the United States. I came here and I had no understanding. I was not informed. I had no information to make an informed choice and that's exactly why we are doing this episode and so I had two c-sections because I didn't have doctors who could tell me that it's possible to have a VBAC even though they were actually almost three years apart and it's just so many things that I myself despite being a doctor was ill-informed. So this episode is truly dedicated to every single child and mothers and families so that you all can make better decisions for yourself. I am so excited to welcome you, Megan. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So tell me, Megan, what or when does a family need to come to someone like you? So it's always an open invitation as soon as somebody finds out they're pregnant or even before I do a lot of preconception discussions mm-hmm. with families when they're, they're sending out their feelers, they're reaching out, they're like, Hey, I'm, I'm very curious about this line of care. What does it mean? What can you tell me? Can you help me understand it? Mm-hmm. And then it's always exciting to turn around and then, you know, I get a lot of like literally from in the bathroom calls 
that <laughs> just peed on a stick and my whole life is changing. Wow. And it's never too early to reach out. Mm-hmm. I'd say more often than not, I do. I get those. Hey, I just found out you're the second person I just told. I told my husband and Aww. that's it's always a blessing. It makes my day anytime that anyone calls, you know, with their happy news. So yes, I can understand that. Board for that. Yes. And to be a part of that beautiful journey, right? It's beautiful. And why should someone choose a midwife? What is it that is different about a midwife versus going to an OBGYN or going to the hospital? What is different? So midwifery care is extremely different from what we generally consider the norm in this country. So a remarkable amount of babies are born worldwide with midwives. The vast Mm -hmm. majority of them are. Mm -hmm. In this country, very, very few are. So we're less common to hear about and and to meet and come across, but still relevant. Midwives really stand firm in the aspect of information and informed choice. Mm -hmm. We want families to be empowered in their birth experience. We like to see good outcomes Of course, you know, like any professional would, Mm -hmm. but we like for the family to be walking along the side, Mm -hmm. you know, for us to join with them in the process of nurturing their body, healing their body as it needs, Mm -hmm. preparing their body Mm -hmm. for this sweet blessing that's coming their way. So we talk a lot, a whole lot. Um, Our appointments are a minimum of an hour long for Mm -hmm. most midwives. Mm -hmm. We sit, um, some of us come in your homes, we sit on your couch, we play with your pets. Well, we talk about everything under the sun, whether it's pregnancy related or not, it's all involved. That's awesome. It all circles around to have good benefit for the family, for the mother, and then thusly for the child that is coming. So midwives can provide clinical care as well. We're not just all talk, I promise. (laughs) So what I hear you saying, to be clear, is that it's not hierarchical when you go to a midwife. It's more like, you know, you have someone that's involved in your care and involves you in the care of your own bodies and your, you know, family as well, rather than being like, okay, I'm telling you do this and you have to do this and then come back and do this. And this is when you do that. It's not like that. It's more like two people, you know, like a partnership, if you will. Am I understanding that correctly? Absolutely. Midwife just literally translated means with woman. So when somebody comes to you, you said that, you know, you actually do, you know, explain to them informed consent, you said. Can you explain a little bit more about what that or those words mean? Absolutely. So informed consent is the premise of Pros and cons in the most basic sense. So you are giving unbiased information Mm -hmm. regarding a subject matter. So you're giving benefits versus risks in that situation or about the procedure or about the medication or the caring. You're giving just core information and then leaving it to the person, to the individual to make the decision based on the information you have given them and that they have gleaned themselves. From other sources. So basically, they are informed, they are empowered, and they are the ones I received the ones can mention. Okay, so you mentioned about a midwife giving informed consent to their clients. And what does that even mean? So, informed consent or informed choice is the premise where the person is in the driver's seat, if you will, on making their decisions. So, as midwives, as providers, we are providing pros versus cons, risk versus benefit on every subject matter from labs to sonograms to newborn procedures to benefits of different body work or different alternative providers. And we are just, we are getting down to the nitty gritty. We are discussing it with them and also encouraging them to do their own research. I don't want people to stop with me. I don't want them to just trust the information that I'm giving them. I want them to take it and use it as a jumping board, if you will, to do their own research, Mm -hmm. to make their own decisions and really be empowered in their care. So informed choice, informed consent means that I am not in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. I am not telling people, hey, you must do this. You have to have a sonogram today because Mm -hmm. I said so. That's not how midwifery works. Are you saying then that the sonograms and those kinds of things are not really something that people need to get, like they can say no to those things if they so choose? Yes, absolutely. So 
it is absolutely up to the person on what they consent is done to their body. And that's with a midwife. That's with a doctor as well. Now there's, there's always, everyone has policies and in certain cases there are laws, but in almost all cases, there is still the right of informed choice, which is something that so few people know, you know, that's, you do not have to agree to X, Y, Z being done to your body or to your baby you have a choice, whether it's with a midwife or whether it's with a doctor, you get to choose. Wow. So essentially, people who are actually told that you need to get this vaccine, you need to take this medication, you need to do this sonogram, you need to actually, you know, come and get admitted at a certain time and so on and so forth, are all things that people could say, I don't really think so, or I can actually get a second opinion. I want to actually do more research and come back. And it is something that the doctors have to agree to as well, because it is their body. Absolutely. You know, it's kind of interesting because we say this in holistic medicine as well, that everything that I actually share with you is just a suggestion, recommendation. You don't have to do any of the things that I actually tell you. And also my job is to work with what you think is right for you. I'm actually giving you recommendations and I can actually share what are the benefits and not so, so much of the benefits of what we are doing, but you don't have to make any of those choices. And it's wonderful that, you know, you do the same thing for pregnant women, but that's not really conventionally or in the Western world, that's not common at all. Right. It's really not. And that's a shame Yes, because at the end of the day, just almost everybody is really, truly trying to do their best yes. with the information that they have. Correct. But if they don't have the information, it's awfully hard yes. to do, to stand behind the decisions that you, in some cases, don't even know you're allowed to make. I agree 100%. I agree. And yeah, especially because so many times I think people make choices because they don't know that there is a choice and they make those choices and then they regret it but they have never really been given the information of the pros and cons of that choice. And that's the reason why they made those choices. And, you know, I see, unfortunately, in my practice, way too many of those patients who have made decisions based on whatever a provider told them without knowing that they can actually think about it or it didn't sit right with them, but yet they thought they didn't have a choice and made their choice. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's they wonderful. felt pressured or, you know, it just, it comes down to so many different variables, but yes, I agree with you completely. That's amazing. I love that. What else would you say that is a difference between going to a midwife and going to an OBGYN, if there are any others? So one of the biggest ones is honestly, it's connection. It's just down home human connection. Mm. So we care about our families. We care about our moms. We care about our dads. We care about our older siblings, their pets. Mm -hmm. You know, we care about the baby in the womb mm. that is growing under our hands. So the people that come see us, these clients, and that's, again, that's their clients. They're not patients. Mm -hmm. So that is a whole perspective shift in and of itself. But the main thing is that I'm saying is connection is it's huge. We care. You're not just a number shuttling through. You're not, not a cow in a chute. It's so different. Um, we're growing, we're bonding most of the time through multiple babies, mm -hmm. sometimes through generations. There's mm -hmm. granny midwives out here that have caught mothers that are having babies these days yeah and it's human connection and that's missing in so many aspects of our life but childbirth is such a huge monumental thing i agree and you actually mentioned something about clients versus patients what do you Correct. mean by that so in midwifery care they are coming to us midwifery is in of itself not considered medical and what does that mean again so it means that we are not here to treat. We are not here to diagnose. Huh. We are here in a complementary sense to verify that everything is normal and staying low risk. Midwives only provide care to low risk clients, but we do not call them patients. We don't want them to think they are patients. We are not here to doctor them. We are not here to treat them like a doctor would. We're here to Again, we're here to counsel, we're here to guide, we're here to assess, encourage, to love. So it, it's just a completely different perspective. So not that there's not a place right. for that, but... 
So does a pregnant person need a doctor in order for Sometimes. them to go through pregnancy and childbirth? Occasionally, yes. I would say, but statistically, most women, most pregnancies are low risk and would be excellent candidates for midwifery care and even out of hospital birthing. So the vast majority of pregnancies are low risk. They're not medical emergencies. And most of the time, care can competently be performed by a midwife. Wonderful. So when does a person need an OBGYN? So if they have pre-existing health conditions, such as heart conditions, active asthma, seizure disorders, a C-section that had a vertical incision, or a history of prematurity, often those are cases that they need at least collaborative support with an OBGYN, if not full care. Great. Wonderful. That's awesome. So once someone conceives... How often do they actually come and see a midwife? And is it different from how often they go see an OBGYN? As well as the processes that are done in the sense that ultrasounds, lab works, any of those things are all performed by a midwife where there is no need for an OBGYN or going into a hospital in low-risk pregnancies? Yes, midwives, we do standard prenatal care, mm -hmm. which does include verifying that the mother and the baby are staying low risk. Uh, midwives are capable of doing laboratory testing as well as referring for sonograms. So it's just because you see a midwife doesn't mean you don't have access to those things. And in the beginning, we typically see our clients about once a month, mm -hmm. unless they need more often. And then by the time they reach their third trimester, around 28 weeks, we see them every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then as it gets closer to delivery, around 35, 36 weeks, we see them weekly. Again, it depends on the midwife. Some offer different schedules, but this is a pretty standard schedule. And honestly, it's very similar to what the OBGYNs do as well. Okay. And so are also the lab works as well as the ultrasounds offered at the same times that they would get at an OBGYN? I would say similar. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So just without a lot of the pressures in a lot of cases, again, lots of information and then you deciding, are you comfortable with this test? How would you like to check for gestational diabetes? Mm -hmm. You know, how would you not? Mm -hmm. And them having the options. We don't standard do sonograms at every visit. Like you'll often see at an OB gen. Mm -hmm. I have some families that are completely against sonograms mm -hmm. and that's okay too. Mm -hmm. Again, it's informed choice. So if they do say that they don't want sonograms, are you able to still give them the care they need and have safe delivery of those babies? So I, as a provider, strongly prefer to have a sonogram. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a good way to make sure that the baby is also safe mm -hmm. in there and that we're not expecting any unexpected anomalies in an out-of-hospital birth setting. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, we are still providing thorough care as thorough as we can without a peek inside the body. You know, we're laying hands on bellies, we're still, we're checking positions, we're checking growth, we're measuring, we're listening to the baby. But it's, I mean, sonograms are a relatively new technology, to be honest. Right. Looking at it in the grand scheme of things, right. it's midwives that have been doing it for almost 40 years. I mean, they look back and, you know, sonograms are just, they're new and fancy. Right. But for those of us of this newer generation, sonograms, you know, they're something that we just consider a normal part of care as long as the families are comfortable that's, with it. That's wonderful. So a midwife, would they prescribe medications if they are needed during the pregnancy? It depends on the type of midwife. So there are two varieties of midwives. It's certainly in the state of Texas, you have your licensed midwife and then you have your nurse midwife. So the nurse midwife has prescriptive privileges with their covering position. Mm -hmm. uh, the licensed midwife in in most cases, they are getting prescriptive options from their collaborating physician. Okay. If they have one. Okay. Some midwives do, some midwives don't. I do. Okay. So if we have something that we're not able to handle naturally, which is always our first course of treatment, mm -hmm. then we do have a fallback option if we do need something prescriptive. Okay. So during the pregnancy, is that something that's often like medications during pregnancy that are considered as safe? to a large extent in this world right now. What is your opinion on that? And what are the things that are, you know, pros and cons of that? 
So I honestly, I don't feel like hardly anything over the counter is actually safe especially things that are considered very inconsequential Mm -hmm. like Tylenol. Mm -hmm. Tylenol, it's a soapbox for me (laughs) to stand on. I agree with you 100%. Yes. And I don't, I more often with my clientele, I get asked for natural options. Mm -hmm. Um, But every once in a while I'll get a question like, oh, is this Mucinex safe? Mm -hmm. Or can I do Claritin D? Mm -hmm. No, my dear, you cannot. Mm -hmm. Um, In so many cases, but I'm grateful that they, you know, that they do ask. And then we are talking about it. Right. We're talking about different pregnancy categories of medication. We're talking about potential side effects. We're Mm -hmm. talking about risk to mom, risk to baby. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of all of it, they are the ones that get to decide if that medication passes their lips or not. Mm -hmm. And you also give them options, alternatives to them so that they can have that choice. Because I think most moms who do come to any of us, you or me, they actually don't really know the alternatives to them. And that's the reason why they choose whatever is over the counter, not necessarily because they want to put, you know, things that could harm their own bodies or their baby's bodies. Absolutely. Yeah, I know they are lacking in information and, you know, you just simply don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And when it's just considered widely safe, you just take it for granted, even if it's just truly not. Correct. And that's something that I love again, because I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's so important to have a healthy conception, healthy pregnancy and healthy delivery, along with a healthy baby later, because so many of the times, I mean, Unfortunately, in my practice, I have like 60% of my patients are children. Yes. That says it all. Yes. Because this has never been the case. You know, in the 19 years I've been in practice, I have never seen as many kids as I see today with chronic diseases. Oh, wow. They're needing more. Yes. And chronic diseases, I'm not even talking about any more like colds and ear infections and strep throats. Of course, that's part of the problem as well. But that's not the only problem. It is these chronic right. diseases that these children have, and it's mind-boggling to me. And I do totally believe that the whole system starts with conception. And that's the reason why I'm so excited to have you here and share all this, you know, golden nuggets to the you know listeners so that they can make better choices because everything, like even Tylenol during pregnancy, really affects the glutathione production in the mom and as well as the detoxification ability of the baby in the womb which means that the baby has less chances of detoxifying itself when it comes into the world and gets exposed to different things. And then they get sick often and then they take Tylenol more, they give them Tylenol more and the whole process continues on and on and on with more infections, more antibiotics, and then their gut gets completely messed up and then more chronic infection, chronic diseases. Oh my God, the whole process is just unbelievable. Yes, fast paced and never ending. Yes. And what we actually have now is not really a fast pace. It's just that parents who are struggling with all of these things and just don't know what to do with these chronic diseases. And they are actually suffering more with their child. So I don't think it's going anywhere good. No, not going the right direction at all. So I love that, you know, you are there to give people this kind of direction for them to make better choices. I think that's such a beautiful service that we need in this world right now. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be a part of it. So then what happens? So once they actually go through the pregnancy, are there certain kinds of myths that you have heard about pregnancy that you want to break down for our listeners? There are so many different random myths as well as like old wives tales that circle through the generation. I hear so frequently, well, my grandma said that I can't raise my arms above my belly Mm -hmm. or above my head, that it'll twist umbilical cord the knots in the umbilical cord, you know, it's stuff like that, that we as providers are like, Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. What? (laughs) So, but but, you know, at this point, I feel like I've heard, I have heard so many of them, but the, one of the myths that tickles me the most is the heartburn and the hair myth, because you have this, this vicious heartburn that this baby's going to come out with a a full head of hair. And I think in some ways the mom's like, Oh, it's going to be worth it because my baby's going to have hair. (laughs) Mm, No, ma'am. So that's 100% not correlated at all. There is no evidence to say that because you have heartburn, your baby's going to have hair. That one always tickles me, you know, and when the baby comes out and they're like, oh, there's not any hair. Like, I am no, I'm sorry. Right. And the thing is, but it's I mean, kind of interesting that even that is going around still because we know more the anatomy and physiology nowadays, right? Where the uterus has nothing to do with the stomach. 
and no. they're all completely no. in different places and they don't really correlate with each other or have any effect over each other so it's a interesting thing it's still you know it's blatant misinformation that's still you know it's passed on it's passed on from generation to generation right along with these myths are there some things like for example you know hemorrhoids or anything like that that when they do actually have it do you give them pointers to how to prevent it from happening rather than dealing with it once it comes absolutely yes so there's everything through midwifery is incredibly nutrition focused mm-hmm. so we are really looking at back to basics because so often pregnancy complaints are common common fixes if people are just truly drinking enough water mm-hmm. and eating good foods it's remarkable how few pregnancy problems we in turn have mm-hmm. but it's going back to it and it's addressing it it's looking at the body as the whole system and seeing what it does in fact need or doesn't need what do we need to be taking out mm-hmm. to give this body more balance mm-hmm. to avoid the common pregnancy symptoms that's wonderful so you're saying that when somebody has acid reflux or hemorrhoids you don't just give them a medication for that but you actually teach them how not to have the problem that needs to be treated yes exactly that's absolutely awesome. so then once a patient actually goes or a client goes through the pregnancy and now they are ready for labor how do you educate the client on when they are ready for labor and again there are so many myths associated with it okay that oh you know you need to actually go get induced or planned c sections what do you say about those things oh i say that almost always a baby knows exactly when it's supposed to be born hmm. and that is remarkably common that the mother is in full disagreement <laughs> with it because i mean you think about it we're largely pregnant we're vulnerable we're emotionally vulnerable we're mentally vulnerable yeah and most of the time we are just miserable we're full of baby yeah and <laughs> in those cases i feel like we are just we are so at risk to people coming in and saying oh hey you know do you want to have that baby this tuesday mm-hmm. aren't you ready to have that baby right and so many of us are going to be like heck yes yeah. i'm ready to have this baby get it out of my body please <laughs> i mean with my pregnancy with my first daughter especially she was due on the 19th of may and she wasn't ready to come out even by 31st <laughs> on 30th yes. of may and i was so done with the pregnancy you know by 19th i'm thinking okay you know it's almost coming i was able to hold on to my gut cuss if you will until then but then once it passed 20th 21st 22nd it's like oh my god i'm just ready but yet i knew better to not do anything because you know my obg wine at that time was terrible and she was willing to cut me open and get the baby out right she was like it's 40 weeks you're done you don't have to wait anymore i said no the baby knows best i'm going to wait but every single day but i do wish i had somebody like you that was supportive that was saying to me that you know what every day that you actually wait your baby is getting stronger your baby's lungs are getting stronger the body is maturing yes. and the bod- baby knows exactly when it's going to come out and it has it's going to have a great immune system because it got all that extra nutrition extra time to mature and it's going to be healthier baby but i mean i had to say this to myself when the whole world was telling me what are you crazy why are you waiting you know it's like 41 and a half weeks 42 weeks almost you don't have to do this right and it's i went to 42 weeks with my son Mm-hmm. as well. So, but it's so our babies their lungs will actually emit a protein. Right. When they are developed appropriately and ready and our body takes in that protein yes. and it recognizes it, that, you know, as the waving flag that it is to say, "Hey, my body that so intelligently and so intentionally created this baby mm-hmm. is now ready to intelligently and intentionally give birth to it." Mm-hmm. not because my doctor's going to go play golf, you know, right. on Sunday right. or, you know, because somebody's tired of waiting because the grandma thinks, you know, that she had all her babies early. I mean, it's it it all gets in their heads and it's just brutal. Yes. But it's it takes so much encouragement in those final days and those final weeks to say, "Look, you know, I I know that you're feeling all of this, but there is purpose. There is reason to the rhyme." that this is an intentional design 
and your body knows how to make your baby and your body knows how to birth your baby. So, you know, and we're increasing our monitoring at the end as well, you know, so we are able to actually give them reassurance from a clinical standpoint as well. Your baby is moving well. Your baby's heartbeat has great variation. Your vital signs look wonderful. Your body is healthy and your body is coping with these big changes, with these big feelings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's, and it's all okay. That's beautiful. So really, essentially, it's not really 40 weeks, isn't it? Like everybody is told it's 40 weeks. And I think that's something that has made it into everybody's psyche. And now everybody thinks everybody has to have the child by 40 weeks. It cannot be 39. It cannot be. So it's almost like, you know, another myth that's associated with pregnancy rather than it's kind of like between 38 and 42 weeks. It can be anywhere in between that. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Babies don't have a calendar in right. there. They're not marking off the days right? and when they're supposed to come out. And yes, they can come early. They can come abnormally early too. Yes. But in most cases, they don't. Most cases, they're going to go a little bit over. Yes. Because, you know, that's, and who knows exactly when conception happened. Just and- because your doctor or your midwife even, you know, looked at a calculator or a little cardboard dating wheel. Just because we looked at that and told you when you got pregnant does not mean that that's when you got pregnant. We weren't there. Yes, I agree 100%. And the other aspect of it is that the more we wait for the baby to make the decision and come out, the baby is going to be healthier once it comes out and it's not prone to as many infections and problems that comes with it. Am I right? Absolutely. And developmentally too, emotionally. That baby will be easier to soothe. That baby will be a more content baby. It will have more brown fat. It will be more suited to life outside of the womb than it would, you know, if we gave in and got induced before our baby was actually truly ready. Babies, they're not textbooks. Right. They're not robots. <laughs> they all mature a little differently. They grow differently. They are all very, very unique, just as we are. Yes, that's beautiful. And I think this is so important to get this information out there because. Again, most people don't know this. Even doctors don't know this. And it's scary. Yes. So yes, I agree. once somebody is in labor, what is the ideal environment for that labor to progress in a safe, comfortable manner for both the mother and the baby? So the mother needs to feel safe. She needs to feel like she is supported. And ideally, if it is quiet, if it is dark... Then, and we're avoiding loud noises, we're avoiding jarring motions. We don't, we're not moving really quickly. We're not saying things really loud. That lets the mother's hormones mm-hmm. come and rise and peak like they are supposed to. It really helps her to get into herself and into her body mm-hmm. as she needs to for the great work that is coming of birthing the baby. So it's when we have bright lights, when we have people asking us questions, it's it's so counterintuitive. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, yes, sometimes interventions need to happen. You know, sometimes we are needing to monitor. But in so many cases, these things can be done in such a more intentional way. And which is not really the hospital birth. So many a times to go into labor and let the labor progress in the most beautiful, effective way that it does, a home environment or maybe even like these birthing centers are more ideal than hospitals where there are bright lights and there's all kinds of things that are beeping constantly and people that are going in and out constantly and putting their fingers up your vagina and checking your cervix. Is that actually conducive for a good birth? Not at all. It's the closest that we can get to nature with our bodies. We don't really, so many people don't think of it that way, but our bodies are a part of nature. We are mammals. We need it as simple as possible in so many cases. So what does that look like on a regular basis? Do you go to their homes and is that where a lot of the births take place? Mm -hmm. So right now I am doing strictly home births, Mm -hmm. which I really, really enjoy. I like meeting people where they're at. Mm -hmm. I like being in their homes. I like that connection. Mm -hmm. So it's... It's not them coming to me. It's me coming to them. Mm-hmm. So I am in a service role. Definitely. And I really, I, I feel like that helps yes. with so many mentally as well. Of course, because one, you don't really have to rush to a hospital in a car with, you know, everything's worried, concerned, and then trying to fill out paperwork at the hospital. I mean, all the things that I've had to do with my pregnancies was just so strange. And another thing that I want to also ask about is, So once somebody is in labor, 
do they have to be tied down to a bed is that how the labor actually progresses well no honestly it's not at all our body is very dynamic it needs to move mm-hmm. it needs to shift and most of the time mothers are very very intuitive mm-hmm. in labor if mm-hmm. they're left to do their own thing yes. they know how their body needs to move to help their baby to move down or to rotate in so many cases their bodies when they're just given freedom mm-hmm. a woman will move her body she will change her positions and you know we're still monitoring i provide intermittent monitoring with a doppler mm-hmm. but that can happen whether she is squatting or standing in the tub walking in her backyard it just i follow her mm-hmm. and i listen to the baby on a recommended schedule that's beautiful and again another thing that i think is so detrimental is how so many women go into the hospital and they're tied down to the bed and not really allowing the birth to take place in its most natural way it's supposed to and so many babies or so many births have to become c section instead of a normal vaginal delivery because of this whole process that's been done and the sterility of the whole process right and so what do you do for pain a lot of times people of course you know if the labor isn't really progressing the way that the doctor thinks in most cases they are actually give pitocin right the inducing ones right. which can actually also reduce the heart rate of the baby and cause you know stress to the baby and so on and so forth so in those cases what does a midwife do it depends on you know what is the reason mm-hmm. for the slow and slow of progress mm-hmm. so often it's is the mother dehydrated is she not well fed or is she truly just exhausted mm. does she need all of us to leave her alone with a pillow between her knees and mm-hmm. just give her a minute mm. it's so very variable mm-hmm. depending on the situation because mm-hmm. sometimes you know sometimes they need electrolytes mm-hmm. sometimes they need some easily absorbable protein mm-hmm. sometimes they need some alone time mm-hmm. sometimes they need to really reconnect with their partner in that space mm-hmm. to just know okay you know i am safe it's okay my baby is coming and everything is as it should be so and of course if those things are not working we have other tricks of first leave like acupuncture mm-hmm. um or positioning i'm a big fan of spinning babies mhm so there are so many different bodywork mechanics that we can do as well we've got lots of tricks up our sleeve wow if there is something that does need to be addressed so often though it's again it's going to be basic building blocks is it food is it water is it rest mm. so you're saying um, that they don't really need pitocin instead they really have to be looking at why they are having something and really working on that rather than trying to just make the body force the dilatation absolutely so often it's the baby's head position you know to where the body is trying to shift the baby well yes pitocin will go on and force that through yes but you know in so many cases we can do different movements mm. to really to move her body to shift her body to allow that baby to do the work that the baby knows it's designed to do yes And so when the baby's head position is not right then what are the things that you do about it like do you go and do internal rotation of the head in order for it to be in the right position for it to come out as a last resort mm-hmm. so ideally we are we're shifting the body we're shifting the pelvis to see we're doing inversions or you know we're putting one leg up on something with a contraction or a belly lift mm-hmm. so different tilting and so often i mean a baby doesn't want its head to be in the wrong position that mm-hmm. doesn't feel good to them mm-hmm. so babies are very very intelligent they're smart mm-hmm. and it doesn't take much of a change mm-hmm. when it's the right change for that baby to be able to correct its head and come down So sometimes yes it does help to be able to help them internally mm-hmm. but I would say not commonly most of the time it's it's an external rotation by the mother moving her body not us turning the baby in labor even wow that's so enlightening because again you know so many obgyns even don't do that and they don't even do any more internal rotations or external rotations they just tie the mother down to the bed and then they just have to wait and then they'll do epidurals and they're tied more down and the baby doesn't come out then it actually ends up to a, you know in a c section right right and then the next thing that i want to go to and address is the pushing once you're fully dilated 
Then they say, well, now you're ready to push. So should a mother be pushing the baby out or is there something called as a fetal ejection reflex that comes into play automatically like our gag reflex or, you know, the vomiting things that, you know, it, it's something that the body is designed to do or is it something that we have to manually push the baby out? So our body will push for us. Yes, fetal ejection reflex is triggered by the baby's head descending onto a specific nerve mm. at the rear of the pelvis. And that triggers our body with this uncontrollable downward motion. Mm. And so often it's like, oh, I didn't know I was pushing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, you know, you can work with your body with that. You mm-hmm. can breathe with your body through that mm-hmm. um, to release tension in different areas to make it easier. Or in some cases, you can push right along with it. And it's just so much more efficient yeah. than, you know, when a mother's like, oh, I don't feel like I need to push yet. Mm-hmm. Well, then let's not. Mm-hmm. Why are we going to waste our energy? Right. And it's actually, that's one of the reasons for a lot of tears, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes. So when a baby is allowed to rotate and descend through the lower pelvis like it needs to, when a baby is able to stretch the perineum as it is designed, Mm -hmm. you are way more likely to stay intact, which I mean, I I tell people frequently, I throw away out of date suturing supplies and lidocaine all the time because it's so uncommon that I need to suture. Mm. And that's something I'm so grateful for because, I mean, our bodies are designed to stretch. Yes. And the perineum is stretchable to a large extent. And so what do you say about the episiotomies that are done where they actually cut the perineum open in order for the baby to come out? I would say that in so many cases, they're not necessary. Mm -hmm. So every once in a while, of course, I can't say across the board that something is not necessary. I myself, out of all of the babies that I have caught, I have cut one Mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. And it was with full informed consent from the mother. And it was about half a centimeter long. Mm. Wow. So, I mean, it's, she wound up with two stitches from it, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but it was was a game changer for what we needed in the moment. So, but I would say Again, the vast majority of them aren't really necessary. What they need, they need time. They need additional pressure from that baby's head to stretch Mm -hmm. those tissues. Mm -hmm. They need patience. Wow. You know, I have to say this, that your clients are extremely fortunate to have someone like you who is well-educated on this, confident, so that they can carry those clients with them, with that information, as well as that confidence. And it is just so beautiful i mean truly as you're talking all this megan megan i'm really thinking wow you know i wish i had known you sooner (laughs) you are so kind and so sweet i'm honored by your words thank you it's it's work i'm honored absolutely honored to do yes and i think all of this is things that everybody really needs to know so once the baby comes out now are there things again there are so many things that's connected with this which is the umbilical cord and the placenta and what needs to be done with it. Do you actually immediately cut the cord? Do you wait? There's so much about it as well as the storing of the umbilical cord. I mean, the stem cells and so on and so forth. So the blood in that. So what do you usually recommend to your clients with those kinds of things? So what I feel like and what I do most commonly, if they are all in agreement, is we wait for white. Mm-hmm. is what that is called. So once when the baby comes out, the umbilical cord is full, it's rich, it's bright blue, it is pulsing with life. Mm. But that lifeblood of the baby, it's going in both directions. Mm. So umbilical cord blood, it, it's an in and it's an out. Mm. So it is still pulsing, it is still working. Mm. And so often, I mean, it can take up to 15 to 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. In a lot of cases, when that baby takes that first breath, it is triggering the body, the umbilical cord, the placental connection to the uterus, it's saying, okay, you've done a good job and we're finished now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, but sometimes it takes time. The body is smart. I have seen a cord pulse for an hour and 20 minutes after birth on a baby that was really slow to transition. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it was like, oh my goodness, Mm -hmm. thank goodness. This baby still has really good circulation. Mm -hmm. This placenta is still supporting this baby. Now, if we just cut it, you know, it's, again, we're going against this 
design. I do not know more than this mother's body. Yeah. I do. I don't. Yeah. Truly, I don't. And I hope I never, ever think I do. <laughs> it is such a good design. And the body knows. The baby knows. And even the placenta knows. We make a disposable organ for every pregnancy. And isn't that just remarkable? Yes, it is. It just, it is. And so anyways, know the... I like to wait until the placenta cord, until the umbilical cord stops pulsing. That's wonderful. Before we, until we even try to remove the placenta. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, there'll be a case, you know, if bleeding is too heavy, mm -hmm. sometimes we're filling up the belly to kind of assess, okay, you know, is, <clears throat> is this placenta partially separated or is it fully separated and still sitting right here? And the baby's heart's just beating so hard, you know, mm -hmm. that we can fill it in the pulse. You're, it's a very dynamic assessment. The reason why I'm asking obviously every single one of these questions is these are all not the default in a hospital setting. It's like, you know, the baby comes out, cut it immediately. The baby is not even really given to the mother to do skin to skin. It's usually taken away, washed immediately, and then wrapped around and then brought back. And then a lot of parents wonder or mothers wonder why they don't, they don't have enough milk supply. Right. And so no, you need that fresh squeezed baby on your chest. Yes. And that's where the baby needs to be for itself and for the mother. I yes. mean, it, that's where they're intended to be. That baby needs to smell you. It needs to hear your heartbeat. Yes. It needs to feel you breathe so that it knows, oh, I got to do this thing now with yes. my lungs. Yes. And on that's... top of it, it's also important for it to be skin to skin rather than over the clothes because then the body oh. heat and all of that kind of, of conveys so course. much to each other, right? Absolutely. Skin to skin connection is important for children from even in the womb. Mm -hmm. They are such sensory beings from the beginning. It is so very important. It's important for the mother too, though, you know, and all the way through childhood. Mm -hmm. So they need to be touched. They need to be stroked. They need to be loved on and they need to have that skin to skin contact. It's, it's huge for both parties. Yes. And actually for mother's oxytocin production, for milk let down, it's such an important thing. And Another aspect of it is that even skin to skin, skin connection with father is as important as it is with the mother that I just wanted to mention here. And I think Megan, you would agree with me on that as well. Absolutely. And even just absorbing the microbiome of the family yes. is huge. They're in skin to skin contact. They're taking in the good bacteria mm -hmm. that are going to provide protection to that baby, to the baby's gut as well. Yes. So it's, again, it's all very, very dynamic. It's an, and it's intentional. Yes. It's on purpose. Yes. You know, these things don't just happen by accident. This is design. Correct. And the father is because, you know, a lot of times the mother could be tired and the father needs to hold and the baby needs to feel safe with the father as well. So the first, as soon as the baby is born, having these kinds of connections, the skin to skin touch really conveys to the baby that these are all the people that you actually can connect with. They are you're safe with and you're always taken care of. And that's, again, another important thing for the baby to grow into a thriving toddler and so on and so forth and also to feel safe so that they're easy to soothe rather. Absolutely. Yes. They need that connection. Yes. And what do you do as a midwife once the child is born for the mother and the baby? Do you continue the care after the pregnancy as well or does it end when the umbilical cord is cut? Oh no, it keeps going. So we care for the family as it grows for about six weeks postpartum. Wonderful. And what does that care look like? What do you do for them at that time? So, so much of it is counseling, truly. It's making sure that the baby is able to latch mm -hmm. appropriately, to feed, to connect, to bond, to make sure the baby is growing, to mm -hmm. make sure the mother's bleeding is staying normal, to make sure she is healing mm -hmm. body, mind, and spirit, mm -hmm. to make sure that the family is thriving is our job. That's amazing. So can somebody come to a midwife even as a regular gynecological care, even when they are not pregnant? With a nurse midwife, yes, you can. Amazing. And then once again, after the baby is born, I'm sure that you also have people that you can refer the mother as well as the baby to in terms of, uh, you know, looking for tongue ties and things like that, that could literally maybe affect the baby with latching or nursing and so on and so forth. Am I right? Absolutely. Yes. Now it's, I have my whole list of favorite places with different body workers 
that are able to look at the baby's mouth and tongue from, you know, all perspectives to see, you know, where is this disconnect or does this truly need to be revised or does it need to be stretched? Mm. So lip and tongue ties are something that I feel like are completely underassessed yes. and such a huge thing. I agree 100%. And even many a times in my practice that I see and I teach people about this is that the number of the expanders and the braces that actually kids have to get could be so effectively reduced if these things were checked at birth and after that as well. You know, it's just crazy that none of these things are taken care of at that time. And then almost every other kid needs either expanders or braces or both. Absolutely. Yes. No. And I believe, again, it begins at birth. Yes, I agree 100%. So this has been such a pleasure, Megan. I mean, you're such a wealth of knowledge and I love how every single aspect of it you have addressed so that our listeners can make a better informed choice. And thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate you so much. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's been absolutely an honor. So thank you, everyone. I love that you could have Megan here and do all these things, you know, talk about everything that has always been on my mind. And sometimes it's harder for a practitioner like me to go over every single aspect of these things. And that's the reason why you need a midwife. If you are planning on getting pregnant or you are pregnant, you need someone like her on your side who's going to truly take care of you. And so don't ever think that that's something that you don't want or you should go with the flow of how everybody says that you need to go with OBGY and that's not necessary. We really need to start understanding that our bodies are meant to do this and we just need our cheerleaders to be able to help us do this better for ourselves and for our babies. So the way the hospital works and the procedures that are taking place right now isn't really conducive for you or your children and that's what I've been seeing with older kids. So allow yourself, give yourself the gift of taking care of yourself in a better way so that you can give that back to your children. So thank you for listening to me today and listening to Megan. It's been an absolute pleasure interviewing her and giving this information, bringing this information to you. So I know you have places to be and things to do. I appreciate you listening to us and getting yourself informed. Subscribe to our channel so that whenever we do have a new episode, you know that it's coming up. And also share this with everyone that you know that might benefit from this information. That's the whole point of doing this so that you can get informed and your loved ones can get informed. Thank you so much. And I'll join you next time with a brand new episode.